I'd like to read from Psalm 32, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 32, verses 6 and 7. Therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall not reach him. Thou art my hiding place. Thou dost preserve me from trouble. Thou dost surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we seek you during this time. We bless you for being so gracious and so loving, kind to each and every one of us. Uh, truly, your mercies are new every morning. Uh, we give you this time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, Jane is going to bless us with special music. Our scripture reading for today is the same as last week, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with power through the Holy Spirit, in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly 
beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, uh, open the eyes of our hearts to this passage of scripture and what you've laid on my heart this hour, this day, and impart it to your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. I trust you are staying strong in mind, body, and spirit as much as possible during these bizarre times and with conflicting messages and confusing statements from those who are in authority. It's kind of like playing a game and making things up as they go along. Uh, just my observation and my opinion. What I'd like to do is build off of last week's message. So last week we looked at the Apostle Paul's prayer in Ephesians chapter 3. And I indicated that it was a fourfold aspect to this prayer. Let me reread it. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints the breadth, length, and height, and depth, and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up to all the fullness of God. What an incredible prayer. Now, last week we only looked at the first part of that prayer about being strengthened in the inner man or the inner person. And recall that I talked about this strengthening process is actually a work of the Holy Spirit. It is not a work of man. It must be spirit-driven. It must be spirit-given to truly strengthen the inner person. And I sought to explain how this process happens as God transforms our thought process. And what he does is he takes spiritual truth from the Holy Scriptures and he renews our hearts and our minds and our spirits in the things of God. So today, we're going to consider the second part of Paul's prayer, and that prayer is, so that, you might, so that Christ might dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, that's a significant statement. The key words are through faith. That is, through this strengthening process, faith has a huge role to play. Now, again, allow me to touch on some faith-related issues before I analyze the concept of faith. First, it's important to be ever mindful that faith is a divine gift. We've talked about that over several weeks ago. This divine gift is freely offered to all. And we see this contained in the verse in John chapter 3, verse 16, where God, whereby God presents the gift of Christ through faith. Uh, John 3, 16, you probably know it well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Whoever believes, it's as simple as that. God is not willing that any should perish, whoever believes. Now, it's important to also remember that when a gift is offered, one has to take hold of it to possess it. Last week, or the other week, I used a Bible. This week, let me use um, my cell phone to illustrate this. If I say to you that this is a gift and it has your name on it, the only way that you possess it is if you reach out and you take hold of it. That's what we need to do with Christ. I've heard the expression, perhaps you've heard it, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Well, when it comes to salvation, it's ten-tenths of the law. Salvation is an all-or-none process. Either one is saved or either one is not saved. Either one has Christ as their Savior or he's not your Savior. It's all of him or none of him. Now, the truth and the reality is, is that not all people have faith. A second Thessalonians chapter three, verse two states this truth. And Paul wrote that to the, to the Thessalonians. And it's interesting, but if you go over into the book of Acts, it was an unbelieving group of people 
in Thessalonica that actually drove Paul from the synagogue and sought to persecute him as he went from town to town preaching the gospel. Years ago, I witnessed to this, this acquaintance um, or a friend in college. I shared the gospel of Christ with him because I had found the Lord around that time too. And he rejected the notion that scripture was true. He rejected the truth that Christ had resurrected from the dead and he rejected the gospels as a reliable account of these things. What he wanted was tangible evidence. He wanted Christ to be physically standing in front of him before he would ever believe. And it broke my heart to hear him say that. But to this person, seeing is believing. And yet this actually goes against the truth that's put forth in scripture in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. The Apostle Paul wrote, so faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, it's also true that God sometimes does some things unconventionally to bring a person to faith. Uh, he may use situations and circumstances in giving birth uh, to what we call faith. Uh, some would describe it as a God wink that figures into the process of people coming to him. And I, so I started to think about some unconventional methods. And I thought of Thomas, the disciple in scripture, also known as Doubting Thomas. Uh, so Jesus certainly used an unconventional approach with Thomas. You, you'll recall that Thomas did not believe the other disciples regarding the resurrection of Christ from the dead. He did not believe that Jesus was alive. He believed in Jesus. He saw him crucified on the cross. He understood all that, but he did not believe that Christ has resurrected, had resurrected from the dead. And so a week later in the upper room, Jesus appeared to the disciples when Thomas was there. And so God met doubting Thomas where he was at. He just used a different method. But it is always true that God meets us just as we are and where we are to bring us to the place where he wants us to be. But it's interesting, specifically in John chapter 20, in, in this account, Jesus reminded Thomas and all the other disciples that faith was very precious. He said, blessed are those who do not see yet believe. So Jesus affirmed faith in him, and we see this all throughout the Gospels, and he affirmed this even though he used an unconventional method with Thomas. And so here's the principle. The principle is that faith still stands. Blessed are those who believe and yet do not see. Blessed are those who accept the testimony of others in which is also the testimony of scripture. We see the testimony of scripture driven home in Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. And I stress the word story because many scholars believe that this is not a parable. In this story, Jesus actually uses the name Lazarus. If you take a look at all the other parables, Jesus never used personal names in parables. They were just, you know, parables, general stories with no names. In this particular account, he refers to Lazarus. And so we understand this to be a situation that Jesus clearly knew about. And so the rich man dies and he goes to hell. And he wants to come back to warn his family members of the awful place that he is in so that they too do not find themselves there someday where he is. And the reply that the rich man was given was this. If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. 
And so what scripture is stressing here is the accepting of the testimony of scripture itself. Now, last week I had mentioned how mystics, mystics are people who seek spiritual experiences apart from Christ and the scripture. So last week I had mentioned about mystics. I had also alluded to Christian mystics. And through the years and through my time of being a believer, I have come across believers who believe in scripture, but they always want to have this spiritual experience apart from the scriptures with God. And they're seeking divine encounters in ways that I don't believe people should always seek. Now, here's the problem with this approach. When faith takes a backseat to visions and dreams, and when the spiritual experiences seem to take precedence over faith, I believe that we move into the realm of actually displeasing God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. It is not necessary to seek dreams and visions, spiritual experiences and divine encounters. If God wants to do something unconventional in our lives, then so be it, he's going to do it. But what I am about to say is most trustworthy and true. Whatever has been recorded in Holy Scripture, it's totally ad adequate to bring us into a divine encounter with God. As scripture is more than capable and able to give anyone a glimpse into the divine. For example, visions of God have been recorded in scripture. Spiritual experiences have been written. Spiritual testimonies abound. We have over 40 different authors that have written with clarity and unity from Genesis through Revelation. So I would, I would raise the question, what more is needed? In fact, the Old Testament and the New Testament tell us that on the basis of two or three witnesses, an item can be confirmed or denied. And I would also submit to you that if we were to go into court today and I brought two to three witnesses to, to testify or to deny that something did or did not happen, that would be good enough to convict or to exonerate a person in court. So let us remember, Scripture is the written word of God, where God makes himself known to the human race. Now, now that I have some of those faith-related things that out of the way, let's explore and dissect what it means that Christ dwell in our hearts by faith. So I ask the question, what is faith? Now, faith is often described as a thing that is subjective to many people, and it's also hard to define. We come closest to a definition of faith uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Let me read that for you. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. So assurance and conviction are key words here, but I think the easiest way to understand faith and to break it down is this. Faith helps us to spiritually get where God wants us to be. I liken it to a vehicle that spiritually transports us to the place where we can lay hold of the promises of God, where we believe in those promises, we're affirmed in those promises, and we're deeply spiritually strengthened in those promises. Now, as a pastor, I've had many people through the years, believers and unbelievers, tell me that they struggle with faith. And I raise this question, if one struggles with faith, how then can Christ dwell in our hearts by faith? I've heard believers say, I need more faith. I do not have enough faith. I need a greater faith. This tells me that their understanding of faith has been vague and elusive and obscure. 
I've also had people wanting to place their faith in good works rather than in the God who has created them. And so this too is a misunderstanding of faith, and I might add, a misappropriation of faith. Now, I believe that faith has been largely misunderstood because of the way in which it's often been presented. Listen to this. In Luke chapter 17, verse 6, Jesus said, If one has the faith of a mustard seed, so it is not about the quantity of one's faith, or the size of one's faith, or the greatness of one's faith. It's about the quality of one's faith. Faith is a divine gift. It is the same faith that is given to every believer. And in Paul's prayer here in Ephesians, he's encouraging this gift of faith to be used. Uh, you go over to 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter encourages believers to unpack the salvation gift of faith in Christ. In other words, unpack the treasures of Christ and the faith that God has given to, to believe in him. Now, we've all been recipients of gifts or presents at Christmas time or our birthday. And so we're given gifts, and what do we do? We open these gifts, we receive the gifts, we open these gifts, we unpack them, so to speak. And so sometimes we get gifts that require a little bit of assembly, or sometimes we need a basic understanding of how to use them. So we read up on the instruction manual, the assembling of part, or the basic understanding part. And so we also understand that these gifts that are, give, that are given in love, but they're also given with the intent to use them, not to leave them off in the corner somewhere. So therefore, as a gift, when it comes to our faith, we hear scripture, faith comes by hearing, we read the instruction manual, scripture, so to speak, and we seek to understand and use our faith to the glory of God. We seek to use our faith in relation to Christ. We seek to use our faith in the relation to works. We use our faith in relation to the gift of eternal life. We simply believe. We use our faith in relation to being justified, raised, and seated in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And we use our faith in relation to trusting God, having confidence in God, and relying upon him. We unpack the gift of faith and God's promises to us. It's as simple as that. And as the Holy Spirit takes the truth of Scripture and unpacks these things to our hearts, we begin to lay hold of everything that God has given us in Christ. And as we do, we're spiritually transported in our understanding of these truths in relation to the world, and in relation to the things of God. So as I understand the Apostle Paul's prayer, faith is an essential aspect to the strengthening process. And when our faith is settled, many other things are settled as well. And if our faith is not settled, then how do we become rooted and grounded in faith? How can we ever know the love of Christ? Earlier, I had quoted Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Uh, anyone who believes uh, God must believe that he is uh, and come to him in this way, and that he's a rewarder of those who seek him. And so I spoke of the importance of faith. Well, if you go over to Hebrews chapter 11, it mentions the faith of Abel, the faith of Enoch, the faith of Noah, and the faith of Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph, the faith of Moses, Rahab, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, the prophets, and the faith of others are alluded to, even though they're not mentioned by name. And this is what Hebrews goes on to say in verses 11, uh, chapter 11, verses 33 through 35. 
it says about those people, those great saints, they conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, from weakness were made strong, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Tell me how they did this? By faith. They trusted God. They took him at his word. And if you think about it, trusting God and taking him at his word, that is faith, this has always been at the heart of the matter. From Genesis all the way through to Revelation, faith is a central theme throughout the scriptures. Uh, we see this whole issue of faith, um, trusting and taking God at his word, put forth in Genesis chapter 3. The problem is the devil got Adam and Eve to doubt God's word, and so the rest is history. When we come to the New Testament, we look at James chapter 1. James actually takes up the subject of doubting and spiritual double-mindedness. And what he actually does is he presents a picture of either spiritual stability or spiritual instability. It's kind of like the seesaw effect, the back and forth and the up and down. And this is actually contrary to being rooted and grounded. Back in Bible school, I had a professor, uh, Dr. K. Wood, God rest his soul. And he quoted a popular expression going around in Christian circles at the time. And that expression is this, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. He corrected the saying and put it in its proper order. God settled, said it, that settles it, I believe it. And so when you think of biblical faith, biblical faith goes beyond intellectually acknowledging biblical truth. It extends to having confidence in the person of God, assurance in the person of God, and trust in the living God. And so in that sense, faith is experiential. It's a living faith. It's an active faith. And it brings us face to face with the truth of Scripture time and again. And it's a faith that actually rests on certain foundational truths. For example, God spoke in Holy Scripture, Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2. In these last days, he has spoken to us through his Son. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 18. It is impossible for God to lie. So Paul's second part of the prayer, that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith, we've considered the faith part, and that is accepting the testimony of Scripture at face value. And in this, this part of the testimony of accepting faith at Faith at, at faith at scripture at faith value. Now we let the dwelling part take hold. I want you to follow the logic. We confess our sins to Christ. We are forgiven. Scripture tells us this. Scripture also tells us that when we confess, Christ spiritually enters our hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now Christ spiritually dwells in our hearts according to Scripture. And we have this promise that he will never leave us nor forsake us. We also have this promise according to Scripture. The Lord Jesus Christ testified to all these truths. Scripture testifies to all these truths. And so therefore, we understand by faith that Christ dwells in our hearts. I, I want to leave you with a final thought. Knowing scripture reinforces our faith. It's also huge in the strengthening process, but it's an essential aspect to reinforcing the inner person, spiritually strengthening the inner person. Uh, the Apostle Paul said, 
to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, rightly divide the word of truth. Uh, sadly, because this is not always done, faith can be easily uprooted. Spiritual instability can prevail. Uh, Peter reminded believers in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, about the importance of growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This cannot be overstated. Uh, Paul also wrote in Colossians chapter 3, verse 16, let the word of Christ richly dwell in you. When we do this, we spiritually flourish. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. This is what it means that Christ might dwell in our hearts through faith. Okay, let's quickly sum up. Faith is huge and essential in the spiritual strengthening process of the inner person. Faith involves the accepting of the testimony of Scripture at faith's value. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Faith is also like a vehicle. It transports us spiritually to get us to the place where God wants us to spiritually be. Faith is also experiential. And therefore, when we know the scriptures, it further reinforces our faith. Paul's prayer that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that each and every one of you who hears this message may own this in its fullness. Uh, Lord willing, next week we will consider what it means to be rooted and grounded in love. Let's have a word of prayer. Uh, gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you put a premium on faith in trusting the word of God which is able to make us wise unto salvation. And we bless you that it's a divine gift, and we thank you, Lord, uh, that the scripture says, whosoever will may come, whosoever believes. And so, Father, we pray that you would uh, uh, affirm these truths in the hearts of your people, and that we might be strengthened to the glory of Christ and his church. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless.